All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, just to let you know, we're recording this for posterity, so keep your colorful language to a minimum. It's <laughs> beyond your permanent record. Um, so to get started, my name is Dave Merrill. I'm the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Forestry for the City of Austin. Um, I want to introduce our forestry team that we have with us here tonight. So up front, front row, is uh, Randy Hoffner. He is our Parks Supervisor. Um, he's in charge of all our green spaces, parks, uh, facilities. And then Chris over there with her hand up. Uh, she is one of our community foresters. And Jenna is also one of our community foresters. They are here through the AMPAC program. Um, and they work uh, with the city, um, but through an outside um, entity. Um, they are our experts on the ground, and they're going to talk to you through our talk to you through our presentation, a little bit of tree identification, um, and then infestation identification. And then, and after that, I'm going to circle back, and we're going to talk about what the city plans to do with trees on city property, and then we're going to talk about what the options are for residents with trees on private property. Um, also in the room, if you don't mind, just a quick show of hands of contractors in the room. They're here representing some sort of industry. Um, so we do have some of our contracting partners in the audience. Um, they're here for a very specific reason um, to help all of us kind of get through this and we'll talk about what that means. So all along the way, you have the opportunity to ask us questions. There's certainly gonna be plenty of open time at the end to ask questions. Um, this will be our fourth meeting, third meeting, third, third meeting. Um, I think we found that some of the best information that we get out of this and that we share is information that we exchange. Um, we're going to present information to you, but a lot of times we learn things in these meetings by the questions that you ask and the opinions that you have and the thoughts that you have. So please don't hesitate to share those with us because they're going to help us all learn um, and understand. But with that, I am going to kick it over to Jenna. Chris, Chris is going to start, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit about tree identification. Thank you, Dave. We get to play hot potato with a microphone tonight because uh, we're recording it uh, to be online later. But hello, like Dave said, my name is Chris. Um, I am a community forestry member. Um, so my position is funded by AmeriCorps. Uh, which is a federal service organization and um, I work with the city of Austin and I'm helping this city, Jenna and I are both helping the city establish a community forestry program um, and one of the biggest problems that community forestry that is facing right now is emerald ash borer and I'm gonna go into some details about what emerald ash borer is. Uh, feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So emerald ash borer is an invasive beetle. Um, it's originally from Asia, um, and it's believed to have been brought over to the United States um, by, through a shipment of infested packing materials, uh, like wood pallets. Um, and it's been here for quite a while. It's been here since 2002, actually, um, confirmed, that is. So just a little bit about kind of like life stages a little bit. Uh, so it only eats ash trees, true ash trees, which is trees within the Fraxinus genus. Um, so in here in Minnesota, that's going to be blue ash, uh, green ash, and white ash. Um, you don't have to worry about mountain ash. That is not a true ash tree. That is a different kind of tree. So we're, it only attacks trees in the Fraxinus genus. Um, and it kills trees because the larvae uh, bury into the wood of the tree and they eat the part of the wood that eats all of the nutri that contains all of the nutrients of the tree. And the larvae doing that um, basically chokes the tree, it girdles the tree, and that is eventually what kills the tree. Um, and it is always fatal to our native ash trees. Yes, Dave has a great example here of the, the tunnels going through. Question. Yes. How about purple ash? Purple ash. I am not familiar with that. Light on swing, see better. <laughs> Called an autumn purple ash. Autumn purple, purple ash. ash. Uh, I think that's a white ash. It's a variety. It's what? It's a variety of white ash. It's so it is. It's still ash. susceptible. Okay. 
Um, okay, so we talked, we already talked a little bit about the larvae, but um, so in the beginning of an infestation, uh, a beetle is gonna fly over to a tree. It's gonna land at the top of the tree um, and the adult beetles do eat the, the leaves of ash trees, but that's not the big issue. They're really just nibbling on those leaves to sustain themselves while they mate and lay eggs. And a female beetle is gonna lay 70 to 200 eggs in a clutch. Um, she's gonna lay those on the crevices of the bark. And then those eggs are gonna hatch, the larvae are gonna bore into the wood, and they are going to live and eat in the outermost layers of the wood. It's called the phloem layer. And that is where all of the nutrients and water are transported through the tree. Um, once the larvae are ready to reach maturity, um, they're gonna overwinter in the tree um, in a pupal chamber, and then they are going to come the following spring they are going to emerge from the tree as adults, and um, they're probably going to stay in that exact same tree. Um, they're very lazy beetles. They uh, don't want to move unless they have to. So, like I said, they start at the bottom of the tree. At, excuse me. They start at the top of the tree, and then they're going to mate and lay eggs and stay. In those larvae are going to become adults and stay in that tree and they're slowly going to work their way down the tree. Um, and so by the time that you're seeing symptoms at eye level, that means that that tree has been infested for quite some time because it started at the top and it's worked its way all the way down to the bottom. Um, and it's this continuous reinfestation cycle that uh, means that it's almost always fatal. Um, and then once the tree is dead, that's when they are going to eventually move on to the next tree, which is probably going to be the closest one they can find. So um, we passed around a nice wood sample. Not sure where it ended up. It's over there. Uh, if you got to see, hopefully you all got to see it, but this is just another picture of what it looks like. Um, and then these are the exit holes left by the adults um, when they exit the bark. Um, so it, on the screen, it looks very big, but in reality, these exit holes are very, very tiny. I mean, they're like an eighth of an inch, maybe. Um, you can see them compared to a Canadian coin or like the tip of a knife. Um, they're very small and um, you're really not going to see these until the, the late stages of infestation. And we'll get into uh, signs of infestation here in a little bit. Um, so let's talk about, we know what it is. How does it spread? So we know that EAB has had help by humans to spread. Um, and that's, well, one, it started in Asia. It didn't fly across the ocean to get here. Um, and two, we know that in their natural habitats, they're really good like flyers. Like I said, they're lazy. They don't want to move if they don't have to. Um, and so in the wild, they're really only going to go a mile at a time. Um, and so when we look at this map of the US, we can see that all of that blue area on the eastern half of the US is a, are counties confirmed with emerald ash borer. So, it did not spread uh, across that entire area by itself. And if you actually look at the upper left-hand corner, there's a little cutout box of Seattle, um, or excuse me, Oregon. Um, and there's a little blue dot, if you can see it, uh, up in <laughs> Oregon. And that is actually a county that it's confirmed to have EAB too. And so, Again, how did it get there? Somebody probably transported infested wood. Maybe they went camping and brought their own wood. We don't know. But the beetle didn't fly there by itself. So it's really important that we're not moving wood outside of the quarantine boundaries. So we have a map of Minnesota showing um, the red part of the map is showing um, where that EAB quarantine boundary is. 
So if you live in within that red area, you should not be moving wood outside of that quarantine area. Um, and that's just because we don't want to further the spread. And everything within the green lines um, on that map is considered generally infested with emerald ash borer in Minnesota. And so we can see that in Minnesota, um, it was first confirmed here in 2009 uh, <laughs> um, that it has spread basically the entire southeastern corner of Minnesota and um, three counties in northeastern Minnesota as well. So we can take a closer look at Austin here. Um, so all of Austin is considered generally infested. That's what that green line around it means. Um, and it also, <coughs> Mauer County is within the quarantine area. Um, if you have any questions about transporting wood, this map is a, a live map that is continuously updated by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and we can give you a link if you have questions. Yes. So regarding that, and maybe you'll get to it eventually, are you trying to keep track of <coughs> trees that are infested? I, I believe one in my yard and one in the boulevard is infested, so should I be reporting that to somebody? or um, That'll be addressed later. Did you want to get that, Dave? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about it more later, but we actually do have a, um, a document that you can go online that we can get you access to that for anybody can report any tree in town that they find. It gives you opportunity to put the location all stuff, and then this automatically goes into a GIS map so that we can access. If everybody reported their own trees, then we'd be all done. You know, we'd have all the reporting done. But okay. you can report your neighbor's trees. Like, so, so we want to collect as much information as we can. Yeah, yeah. There's also a QR code on the back of um, this brochure. <coughs> the, back of the bottom one is the link. We have trifold brochures in our, our booth over here that um, would link you to the uh, survey as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, back to the map of Austin. So each one of those uh, red and green like dots on the map is a tree that is confirmed to be infested uh, by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So they were actually just here uh, last November. Um, and Jenna and I uh, got to ride around with them and drive through every single tree, every single street in Austin and look for trees that had signs of infestation. Um, and so all of these dots you see are trees that we found when we um, went out and did that. So as you can see, it is very much here in Austin. And um, as we progress, it will, yes. Did you go to the Nature Center? Yes. They were also at the Nature Center, and it is at the Nature Center. Uh, the. I don't know, I believe one of the dots over by the country club is in the nature center on the map. But let's talk some fun statistics about ash trees in Austin. Um, so there are a lot of ash trees in Austin. It's a very popular urban tree. Um, if you look at the pie chart, about 20% of public trees in Austin are an ash tree. Um, which means there's, on just public property, mind you, this doesn't account for private property, there are about 2,400 ash trees, um, and every single one is at risk of dying by emerald ash borer. Um, and when you factor in private property, that number could be doubled, even tripled, which is a large, uh, a large amount of trees to, um, basically be on the chopping block in the next 10 years. Um, something else to note from this pie chart that is closely related is that you can see there's a lot of maple trees in the city of Austin as well. I mean, almost 40%, that's, that's a lot of trees. And so the thing that to be thinking about when we're replanting um, these trees is to think about diversity because we don't want this to happen again. We don't want to have to see 
thousands of our trees die when the next big bad bug arrives. Um, and so when you're replanting your trees, thinking about um, diversity and what's common and what's uncommon and um, maybe thinking about climate adaptive species as well in the future. So we are gonna get into ash trees next. I'm gonna let Jenna take over. She's gonna teach you what an ash tree is and how to ID it and some other fun things. Thank you. Okay, so we touched on it a little bit. Um, ash trees are very common urban trees. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, when Dutch elm disease came through and um, took out a lot of those elm trees, ash were a common replacement. And so you can imagine if, if you were around during Dutch elm disease, all those trees were just gone. And so we're kind of just repeating history here with um, emerald ash borer, which is we want to be ahead of it, not like last time. Um, so one thing to note is that they have very soft wood and become brittle when they die. Um, and dead ash trees can typically fail within two years. So they're not just going to stand dead for years and years and, you know, just sit there uh, strong. They, they fall apart when they die because they're so brittle. So that is why it's very important to have a plan for your ash trees. Um, and also, the longer you wait and the more infested your trees become, um, the more expensive it's going to be to um, either treat or um, remove that tree because it just will take more resources. It'll be more dangerous. Um, so it's not if your tree gets infested, it's when. So that's why it's very important to have a plan because it is. you can see through the, the maps, it's very spread throughout Austin. So you might not know if you even have an ash tree on your property or on your boulevard. Um, so just some key characteristics you can look for, especially in winter. The main thing you're gonna wanna look for is the um, twig or branch alignment. So trees typically take one uh, or two different types of um, arrangement. Um, the first would be opposite branching, like this ash tree branch you can see in the lower left corner. Um, that means the twigs are just growing out at the same spot symmetrically on the branch. Um, that is one characteristic you will always find in the Fraxinus genus. Um, and the only other tree on boulevards generally will be maples that also have that alignment. So that really cuts out a lot of boulevard trees. So if you're just looking at a tree and you see it has opposite alignment, that really just narrows it down to ash or maple. And then obviously the next thing you can look for once you have that is um, the leaves. Um, you can't see those in the winter, but you can tell they are very different from maple leaves. Um, in the winter when there are no leaves, the next thing you would typically want to look at would be the bark. It has this very characteristic ray um, diamond shaped pattern that will be easier to spot once you spot it. Um, you'll be able to just uh, see that once you can recognize it. And I don't expect you to just know what that looks like from seeing these pictures because I have to be out in the field like looking at them like all day until I get it drilled into my brain that that's what it looks like. So we have a lot of resources over there to look at and I'm sure a lot of you have already picked up some but yeah those are good resources to have as a little bit of a field guide. Uh, one thing um, is Samaras. A lot of them <coughs> still hang on to those seed bundles um, throughout the winter. Uh, you you uh, s maples do also do samaras, but um, the ash trees have a very characteristic teardrop shape, whereas maples kind of have more of a curved shape. Um, so for identifying emerald ash borer, you want to catch it as early as you possibly can. Like I said, the longer you wait, the harder it is to treat or remove or um, it will even become impossible to treat and you will have to remove it because it will be a hazard. So um, one thing you wanna look for in particular would be um, light woodpecker damage. Um, so as you can see, kinda in that bottom corner, you see the flecked off bark, um, that's called blonding. So it will start, like we said, up in the upper canopy of the tree. Um, so, I would recommend even just taking a binoculars. It's best to look for these signs in March and April when there are no leaves on the trees and um, you can see the top of the canopy very clearly. 
Um, so what you might notice is some discoloration, which is that blonding where the bark has been stripped off by the woodpecker. Another thing you want to look for is that little dime-shaped uh, woodpecker hole that you can see um, within the blonding. That is um, a clear sign that it is a woodpecker and not just being flecked off by squirrels. Um, so if you have kind of that flecked off bark um, on the lower canopy or the trunk, you know, that could be just squirrels. That's why you want to look for that little woodpecker mark. Um, and then less than 30% canopy dieback. Um, that top left uh, photo with the 25%, that is 25%. Um, canopy dieback, um, that would be considered treatable generally. So that's why it's so important, again, to monitor your trees regularly. Um, once it's in the third year of infestation is probably when you're going to notice those signs and symptoms. And if you keep waiting, by like the fifth or sixth year, typically that tree is going to be dead. So this progresses very quickly. So it's important to monitor consistently every winter because you might not even notice the canopy um, dieback in that first picture there. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, would nuthatches do the same kind of damage that the woodpeckers do? Um, I'm not sure. Because we have evidently woodpecker damage in the top of our ash, yep. but we haven't heard woodpeckers. We, we see nuthatches all the time. But... Oh, yeah. Um, it really depends. Um, on your tree specifically, it did have a lot of woodpecker holes as well, um, but it, it does depend. Um, yeah, typically what you would look for is um, the woodpeckers would do just just a very small hole because they're very like close to the bark, so it's not always super obvious. Um, I would have to look into that though. Okay. No, it's just you know, like I said, um, like I said, we don't hear woodpeckers. So. Right. Yeah. It's kind of, oh. kind of interesting. That is interesting. I'll have to so look that up. Do you not have rubber beaks? So they're like, <laughs> 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 yeah. Are, are, are yeah, they recycled now? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But like I said, um, a good time to look is when there's no leaves um, on the tree, so you can clearly see where that bark might be flecked off. Are there different kinds of ash trees? Because ours is the dirtiest ash tree ever. It doesn't have the dangly seed pods. We've got round balls. Yep. That would be a male ash tree. Oh, it's and if, they, if it has like the big balls, then it probably has a kind of insect gall yep. infecting the, the flowers, which is what you're seeing. Oh, it's just so dirty. Oh. Yeah, it's awful. But it, you were there at our house mm -hmm. one day, and you told me or told him that that tree is Invested, right. mm -hmm. so take it down. Plus, when okay, the tree's been there a long time. Then we got a new road a few years back. The road is down low, so the tree is way up in the boulevard, and it's hard. You can't even mow around it. You know, it's like a point. So. Cut it off. Cut it off. <laughs> I felt one too. <laughs> I want. We're gonna we're gonna put our name on. Yeah, on your property. <laughs> How are pin oaks? Uh, I'm thinking maybe get a pin oak. Are they pretty safe? A good tree uh, related to the red oak, and but uh, people don't like them a lot because they hold their leaves through winter. And that's okay. The yeah. neighbor's got one. I look at it and I'm jealous. I thought, dang, I wish I had one. Yeah. yeah. I might try that. Yeah. You got those? Say it's for the sir. Yes, so like I said, it might be useful to just take a binoculars. That's what we did when we were first learning to ID emerald ash borer is taking binoculars and looking at the tops of the trees. Um, and also I think Chris mentioned this, but by the time you're seeing obvious damage, like the fourth year of infestation or fifth or sixth, um, it's typically too late for your tree, especially if you're seeing it at eye level. That's a very bad sign. Um, so yeah, again, if you would like resources on IDing either ash trees or emerald ash borer infestations, they're all over there and they will be on the website too as well.
So here is when it would be too late um, to treat. These are late stages of woodpecker damage. Um, as you can see, the woodpeckers have completely torn apart the bark trying to get in there, trying to get the uh, emerald ash borer larvae. And then this would be considered um, more than 30% canopy dieback. Um, typically your tree's not gonna come back from that, so treating would not be worth it. Epicormic sprouting is another sign you might see on a very stressed tree. Um, that's just when the trunk is um, shooting out new shoots trying to live um, and regain some of that energy it's losing from losing all of its leaves. And like we said, D-shaped exit holes, um, they're very, very, very tiny, so you're probably not going to see them unless it's just such an infested tree that you're seeing them at eye level. And then you saw the galleries. Those are the only kind of galleries that, um, I guess in ash trees, the only kind of galleries that an insect would make would be an emerald ash borer. So you won't see that kind of gallery um, from any other kind of insect in ash trees. And then uh, I just inserted a picture here about um, some lookalikes. A lot of people mistake emerald ash borer for six spotted tiger beetle. Um, and we have the, uh, this picture over there in the resources as well. And then I just wanted to touch on benefits of mature trees because some people might be wondering why do we care so much about these trees. Um, trees are a proven way to remove pollutants from the air, clean stormwater, reduce impacts of flooding, reduce heating and cooling costs of buildings, and trees contribute billions of dollars every year in environmental benefits. So one figure we have in the top right, you probably can't read the number, but it says total benefits for this year for Austin is estimated to be over $300,000 just in those trees. They store carbon. Yep, they do, they store carbon. Yeah, so they're a great city resource. So yeah, um, with that, I'll just hand it back over to Dave to tell us a little bit about what residents can do and what the city's doing. Okay, so we got some education, and now we're going to talk about the plan. Uh, we've got two paths we're going to take. One, what's the city going to do about uh, trees on city property, and then, you know, what are residents going to do with trees on private property? Um, our plan, again, like every good plan, has a start, and we're, this plan's not going to be the same plan when we finish this thing. Um, as uh, as Chris mentioned, we've got about 2,400 ash trees on city property. Uh, working with Randy and his crew, we've established that we have the capacity to remove about 250 trees a year. Um, and that's with our crew kind of working full time to go through this whole process, which includes removing the entire tree, removing the stump, grinding the stump, and then planting a new tree in its, not in its place, but replacing the tree. Um, so we can only do that. So if you do the math, this is a 10 year plan to get us through all of this. Um, unfortunately, this crisis doesn't follow that straight linear path. Um, what will happen is if we don't get on top of this quickly and slow this down, this thing is going to go like this and then it's going to hit the wall quickly. Um, as they mentioned, a tree can die within five years. So you can imagine if we did nothing today, all of these trees could be dead in five years and now we're looking at 2,000 trees dead all in one year. That exceeds our capacity to manage this, which then leaves dead, diseased, and dangerous trees in public property, on private property, now we're in a really bad spot. Um, so we have to have this sy systematic plan of getting rid of the worst trees first um, and then extending this process as long as we can until we can work through the cycle where, unfortunately, these trees are removed or treated and protected and then re they're replaced with new trees. Um, so we do have a plan. Um, the worst infestation in town is mostly on the south and southeast side of town. So if you've seen our crews out or you've seen marks on trees, most of them you're going to find over there. That's, when, that's where Randy's guys have been working the most. Um, what's our number at right now, do you think? Oh, probably close to 90 right now. Okay, so we've removed about 90 trees since the start of the year. Um, so we're working to get those, those diseased trees uh, off public property. Uh, along the way... Uh, as we kind of remanage our resources, we do intend to treat trees. 
Um, so we haven't really talked much about treatment of trees, and that's going to be certainly a, a viable option for you guys as residents. Um, but what we're going to do to treat some of our public trees is to be able to extend the life of the tree. Um, some we may be able to protect forever. They may make it through this. Um, but really the end game of this is to stretch this out so we can work through this 10-year plan and manage this without overstressing our resources in any one particular year. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go through and we'll mark dangerous trees, um, either in clusters or identified um, by priority, come in, we'll remove the trees, uh, we'll remove all the materials, uh, we chip the material on site, uh, we haul the stalks away. Um, Andy, our friend back here, uh, Andy owns the logging company, he is accepting our, our, our stalks, um, and we'll talk about kind of a cool thing that we're doing uh, with him along the way, but we're managing the material. And then what we're gonna do is we'll come back in and we'll grind the stump, um, and we'll make you know, everything look as if there was never a tree there, um, however, then, you know, we want to get trees back in the ground. The reality is if you have a tree in front of your house, there's a possibility that you're not getting another tree right in the same spot, clearly, um, and, and maybe not in front of your house, depending on how utilities have changed and everything. No one likes to see those Y-shaped trees because we first, oh, we didn't realize there were going to be power lines there. The utilities there, like. did that. <laughs> <laughs> So we want to be very strategic and intentional with where we put trees back. You may lose a tree in front of your house, but three more may go in Todd Park. Um, our idea is that we replenish the canopy within the city, um, just not always one for one in that spot. Um, so that's the city's kind of systematic plan as we go, and I'm certainly happy to answer more questions about that. But um, yes, Mike. Um. Are you going to be treating any boulevard trees, or is just probably park trees, and or but any boulevard trees? You know, we're going to treat as many trees as we can get to and that we can afford to. Um, anything viable, if it if it seems like a good investment for us to treat it, then we would like to. Uh, we go ahead. I have a good, you know, boulevard tree uh, out of purple ash, which. Uh, appears to be healthy right now, and, and I would be willing to treat it, you know, should I be waiting for the city to treat it, or I just go ahead and treat it? So, uh, and then if I treat it, how can I make sure that there's not a red X on the tree? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are never, as a city, we're never going to stand in the way of you treating, helping us take care of boulevard trees. If you have a tree in front of your house that we can, that, that can be saved, and you can do it quicker than we have the resources of getting to do it, then we encourage you to do so. But we want to know about it. We want to, we want to have that reported. And then any um, company that's going to treat that tree is going to put a little marker on it, a little pin in it. So when we go around to identify oh. trees, we'll know that it's been treated. But telling us also helps. A little bit of redundancy there is helpful so sure. that we don't have that, um, we don't have that mix up. Um, but yeah, we want we would love the help of residents as much as we possibly can in identifying those trees and then possibly treating them. How yes. much does it cost to treat a treat a tree? And and I'll let some contractors speak to this also. But the estimate is about two hundred dollars every two years to treat a tree. Um, Randy, what do you say the maximum diameter is? Do you think anything over twenty four inches is? Uh, or 22 inches, excuse me, it's probably not worth the effort. So if it's too big, it's probably not going to be worth your money to treat. Um, so the smaller, the healthier the tree, we talked about 25 to 30 percent dieback as the maximum. Um, again, anything beyond that, you probably don't want to treat. Um, but it's possible that, you know, with this plan in place, treating a tree for several cycles might get us through this. Um, the problem is we, we people properties turn over hands like you might take care of a tree for the next five or six years and then you move out of your home and somebody moves in and they're like, eh, I don't want to spend the money on that or I don't care anymore. And then now that tree just falls right back into that cycle if the bugs are still in town. So um, it's definitely more affordable than tree removal and just removing the same size tree like a, an average size 20 to 25 inch diameter tree. Um, you're looking at several hundred dollars up to possibly a couple thousand dollars to remove. So it's a big price tag. Um, if you imagine residents that have multiple trees on their property, 
that's not a fun way to spend your money. You got five trees and you got to spend $10,000 to to remove them. There's better ways you probably want to spend $10,000. So if you catch, that's why catching it early and having these meetings and having these conversations to give people the opportunity to maybe stretch that inevitable expense out over several years just makes sense and it kind of helps this process. Um, what questions do you guys have as residents as far as what contractors can do for you, what the city can do? Yes, sir. Uh, just allowing, so if you have an infested tree that you take down, once it's taken down and no longer living, the EABs won't, won't live it. So you could keep the wood for firewood for yourself or friends as long as you don't take it out of the company. Yes, so thank you for that. So yeah, absolutely. The wood that comes down, you can certainly keep on site, burn, do what you want with it. Um, just don't transport it out of the quarantine area. Uh, we like to, the, the less we move this stuff, the better off we are. Um, so if it means not moving it from your property, fine. A contractor, obviously, that comes in and takes down a tree is going to move it off your property, but we're not going to move it very far, um, and we're going to get it to some point where we can do something with it. Uh, the way we manage the bugs themselves when they're in the wood, anything that we chip within, I think it's an inch or an inch and a quarter, um, a quarter inch, okay. Anything that's chipped really small essentially kills the bug. Um, also, when we debark the wood, um, you take the wood off. The wood inside is good wood, and that's why we're kind of reusing it for a lot of other purposes. Uh, we strip the bark off and either chip the bark or you burn the bark, and then it kills the bug. So you still have good wood after that. Um, again, if you keep it on your property and want to burn it in your fire pit or wherever else, not a problem. That's totally up to you. Um, I didn't really kind of put together what this process was like and, and what it's like for these, these larvae in this wood until this winter, Randy's guys were out and they actually pulled that big piece that we passed around off of a tree because it was such a good example. This was in the winter. They brought it in. Randy threw it on my desk in my office. I let it sit there for a week. We had a forestry meeting and we're all sitting around my table and we have these little vials and I think there are a few up here that actually have the larvae in them. And they're in there and you can cool and you can look at them and see what they're like. And there's one sitting on my, uh, an actual larva sitting on my table. I'm like, how did one of these get out? Like who left the cap off of this thing? And like, I'm like, oh, sh you know, whatever. And Chris looks at it, she's like, that thing's moving. <laughs> and then we finally, you know, the finally someone hit him was like, okay, this thing crawled out of that wood. Like it got warm enough in my office, that thing crawled out and it crawled on the desk. And so this is, th this is real. Um, this is what happens. And this is why we don't move the wood. Um, because it's, it's, it spreads by us, um, and we have the control to kind of, we have the ability to kind of keep this all under control if we stay on top of the process. Yes? How are you stopping the process if you're not killing everything that's in the woods? Say that again? When, when you cut down a tree, why aren't you destroying it to kill all the larvae and insects that are in it instead of putting it in your wood pile aren't you just keeping it going then they'll get off of that wood and go someplace else well as we mentioned they don't really move a lot okay. um, so you could cut a tree theoretically you could cut a tree down and let it lay in your yard and eventually the tree is going to die and there's not going to be any nutrients for the bugs to eat so they're going to starve they're not going to have the ability to to eat that anymore if they can't get up and fly or move and go to the next tree then they'll just die off. Um, one of the plans originally some cities used was, let's just cut all the trees, store them for a year or two until the bugs die, and then the wood's good to go. Well, it's not as effective as we really thought. So stripping the bark off um, and then getting rid of the bark and any of the, the smaller saplings and trees or limbs is the most effective way. That's why the wood is still good um, if you can get all the bark off. I can just add, um so the, the reason why just stripping the bark off is usually enough to kill them um, is because they only live in the outermost layers of the wood. Uh, in the, that's where the nutrients and stuff are. The, the stuff that's in like the center of the wood, the heartwood you call, it's dead. It's basically called the skeleton of the tree. And emerald ash borer doesn't live in that part. So um, when we mill the wood, um, it's stripping off the outermost layers where the bugs are living and then that either gets chipped or burned and destroys the beetle. 
and then everything else that's in the center of the wood is fine. It doesn't have it in it. Other questions, concerns? Yes. Uh, your outline on that southeast part of Minnesota, so you can move wood any place in that whole area. That you just the city of Austin is important. Well, the quarantine also goes by county, so they don't want people, and county lines are arbitrary, um, realistically, when we're talking about this. The idea is, let's not move this stuff very far. The more you move it, the more you give it the opportunity. Um, you might throw it in a truck bed, and you, you think you move all the wood from one location to another within that quarantine area, but then you drive your truck out of state, and there are still larvae in the back of your truck. It's just... The rule, it's easier to give people a very strict thing and say, don't move it out of this county or don't move it out of this red line. But the reality is, let's just not try to move it any more than we absolutely have to. Because we're cleaning fence lines and then we just haul it home, you know, for firewood. I would say, please don't do that anymore. Some of that we just haul like tent lines. <clears throat> yeah. Um, the reality is you have to haul it somewhere. Um, again, it's we just have to make our best judgment and do the best we can. Um, again, the less we move it, the better off we are. Um, other questions and concerns? Yes. Are you trying to kind of follow the state guidelines in relation to moving of the wood, or are you trying to even tighten it down more for the city of Austin? Well, we'd like to be above standards, I guess. But the reality is, the rule of thumb is that you don't want people transporting any wood in the warmer season. So it is like November through April, they say, if you're going to move it, that's when you should move it because the bugs are, it's cold and they're not, you know, they're not active. Um, but if you have a dead tree in your yard, we're going to come in and they're going to, somebody's going to remove that thing in July if it needs to be done, right? And that wood has to go somewhere. Uh, if we just keep it all within that reasonable distance, um, close to where it came down and we destroy it in that area, it's really fine, like almost any time. But um, yeah, they set these guidelines because they're kind of trying to dummy proof the whole process um, just to keep people from making the mistakes that are going to spread this to some other area. Is real cold weather, or weather, or weather uh, like a real bad freeze, kill the larvae? Unfortunately, not to the point where it makes a difference. They're pretty adaptive uh, in that regard. You had a question? How long is the larva viable in cut wood if you're piloting? Do they develop into it? It was, initially we were learning that it was a year, that they could live in there for about a year, but it seems like it might be longer than that. Um, so stripping the bark and removing the bark mm -hmm. Destroying the bark is the best way. It's it's not like the woods again. The heartwood's not going to get any worse. So if you keep it on your property, it's it's going to be fine. Now, what if you have a neighboring house with a huge tree that's got the disease, and I doubt if they'll rush out to get it cut down? Um, will they get letters saying you better? So if you have a if you have a tree on your property or you report one that you see that is getting to the point where it's dangerous. And that's kind of, when you do, when you put it to the city, that's gonna be part of Randy's job and Randy's crew's job to come out and make that assessment. Um, if he determines that, yes, this is a dangerous tree, this is, this is disease, something needs to be done sooner than later, they'll get a notice, you'll get a notice that you have 30 days to, to remove this tree. And if it's not done within 30 days, then we send in our city contractor and the tree is removed at the expense of the homeowner. Um, and then that either gets billed directly to the homeowner or it gets put on your tax assessment and eventually everybody pays the tax man. Um, so I don't want you to feel like you're, you're ratting out your neighbor. I would first start with a conversation with your neighbor about how important this is because if it's your neighbor's tree and it falls, you can maybe see where that thing could go. You don't want it to fall on your house. Good looking at it. <laughs> um, and that's the scary part about these trees is that when they do start to go downhill, that decline becomes pretty quick. And it goes from, hey, there's our tree to, okay, this thing could fall down in the next winter storm. So it's going to result in some difficult conversations. Some people are going to get some news that they don't want to hear. But that is the recourse that, you know, we would come in. We would send someone in to cut down the tree. Um, it would be at their expense. It's probably much cheaper to find your own contractor and do it proactively than 
for us to be your tree service. Yes, sir. I had an interesting question from one of my uh, artistic friends and wanting to know if the bark was stripped off and he brought in a chainsaw sculpture, if that would be viable. Um, like leaving the tree stalk standing and yeah. carving it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why. That, that, that. And the tree won't live. Yeah. Right, but yes. Okay. I would say encourage them to top the tree and make sure that oh, know, yeah. it's more of a yeah. totem type thing, you know. Okay. Right. Um, but yeah, for sure. Okay. Again, it's people's private property at that point. They can. But if it's, you know, I know they get brittle and then, you know, they can topple over easily. So, I mean, is there a point where that could be done, but not done, you know, because it's all too far gone or uh, I suppose, yes, there's always a limit to that. But if it's a, you know, if it's a 10 foot stalk yeah. and you've carved, you know, Randy's likeness into it or something. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, and in 10 years, that thing gets rotten and it falls over. I mean, you can look to see how much damage it's going to do. It's yeah. probably not okay. a big deal. But, All right, thank you. Um, if that's our biggest problem, then I will come out and deal with that. <laughs> um, other questions and concerns? Just curious, I've got a video of my ash tree. The wind comes barreling down the street at it, and it's really amazing. And I'm thinking maybe the limb fell off because, oh, how can I get it to speed up? It's unbelievable. Here, I'll stand here. Did it actually fall? Well, big chunk. And that's the one you said has the disease. So I'm thinking that could be dangerous. Yeah. It'll, Okay, the wind is coming. Yep. There it went. <laughs> Can I be on the list for the extreme? <laughs> yeah. But that's a reality. I mean, that looks like a healthy tree. Like, you look at that video and it looks like a healthy tree. And our, our doorbell caught that. It's like, holy moly, how did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why maybe weakened. Um, so we are, we're, the city, there. If you remember uh, back to, and I don't. I'm just saying this. Um, uh, during Dutch Elm, there ended up being some subsidy to help residents deal with getting rid of all these elm trees that we had to get rid of. Currently, there is no local, state, or federal subsidy to help residents deal with this. We're still all on our own. Um, so don't expect any help from the city. We're not writing big checks for you to take care of the trees on your property. Um, but we are trying to lend some expertise, some advice, and trying to find ways to save everybody a little bit of money here and there. Um, so we're talking about ways that we can work with local contractors <coughs> that if they come in and remove a tree from your property, part of the expense that they incur is they have to do something with all this stuff. They have to process it, they have to transport it, they have to do something with it somewhere. Um, if we can work with them to find a place either in the city that we can keep all this stuff and process it and give it to people like Andy who can do good stuff with the wood, then we want to try to be a part of that process. We don't know exactly what that means yet, um, but we want to try to find a way to do that. Um, some communities have like community dumping grounds where everybody can come out and dump their, their ash trees. Well, guess what else people are going to dump in these places? Not just ash trees, not just trees, but trash and everything else. And so that becomes a bit of a concern that, you know, there might be some liability. There might just be more expense on our part um, in managing that. Um, you'd think, oh, well, let's just have a big constant bonfire fire, fire outside of town somewhere. Well, that sounds great, too, for a night. But that means 24-hour supervision of this fire and this constant fire going on. And that doesn't appeal to me, so I don't consider that an option for Austin whatsoever. So they're not going to have a big fire and burn all of this stuff. Um, so we're trying to figure out little ways along the way that we can help cut down a little bit, even if it saves a homeowner $100 or $200 or something in the removal of a tree, then we want to figure out ways to do that with you. No answers yet, but again, that's kind of our line of thinking along the way. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of people in our community that aren't going to be able to write a check for two or three thousand dollars to remove a couple of trees off their property. Um, we also have a lot of people that are um, 
absentee owners, if you will. They, they're property owners, people are renting. You wouldn't expect a renter to write a check for a couple thousand dollars to remove a tree off a property they don't own. The owner of that property may live in the cities or out of state. So we're gonna be dealing with a lot of that. We might have some communication issues and in, in kind of conveying this message that we're trying to share with everybody in our community and, and perhaps to no fault of their own, but it's just gonna require more conversation and more education so people know that this is a big deal. And if we all, if, if you know, 50% of the city does everything right and they get rid of all their trees right away and the other 50% does nothing, we're still kind of in a similar boat. Um, the stuff is gonna still keep happening if we don't do the treatments and we don't remove trees as we need to go. So it's a process. Um, there is a plan, but again, that plan will have to be reevaluated every year, every season um, as we go so we can continue to move forward a little bit. Um, I spoke to a gentleman on the phone who is my wood chip person. Is, did he make it to the meeting tonight? No? Okay. Um, so what we've done is, is I've started to make contacts with several contractors in the community that do tree removal. Um, stump grinding that do tree treatments. Um, Andy is our logging guy, so he's taking some of our material from the city. Um, we, we have some companies that specialize in processing this stuff and they get wood chips and then they repurpose them. The city, when we chip all of our wood, um, we ship that out uh, and give that to local hog farm, hog farmers. So we're kind of repurposing some of this wood. Um, so we're trying to also find ways to make good out of this process. Uh, Andy, who has a mill, uh, we found ourselves in a need for, we needed new posts for all of our new disc golf holes in the city. And we wanted to put new golf tee box signs up. And so we figured out that we can work with him. He's already done all the work. We've got new posts made out of ash trees, cut down from Austin properties that we're gonna put back in the parks later this spring. Um, that, you know, gotcha ash borer. At least we're getting back a little bit, you know, of what you're kind of taking from us. So. We're gonna to try to find creative ways to make good out of this wood uh, along the way and, and do some good things with it. Yes, sir. What's the chemical that they use for treating? Um, it's a neonectinoid. There's another name for it and somebody else in the Question? room. The, the name of the chemical used to treat these trees. Amacloprid. So Amacloprid is the active ingredient. The company makes it. That's sold under a lot of different labels. There's brochures up here on the table that yep. got it all laid out there. Are they want to invest? <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad idea. Not so, a bad idea. So yeah. these originally, a lot of these applications were done by spraying around the tree, um, which then you're spraying pesticides on your property, which are not good for. Uh, for bees, for pollinators, which it turns out that they don't really agree with that type of stuff. Um, so, so don't just spray the trunk no, of the tree. No, nope. so now, no, no. So now the, the best treatment is an injection. So there's a, a hole drilled and then the, the pesticide is actually injected into the tree and it works its way from the inside. Um, just the way the nutrients make their way up the tree, pesticide makes it in there and then the bugs don't want to be there anymore. Um, so it's way more pet friendly and kid friendly and it's, it's really a safe process that we go through. But you wanna have a licensed contractor do that for you. I'm sure there are ways you can Google finding ways to do this your, on your own. I would highly encourage um, you to consult with a professional and make sure that you do this the right way. That way you know that it's effective. Um, I know that all the contractors that we have contact with are reputable and they're honest and they're gonna come out and tell you whether or not treating this tree is a good idea or not. Um, they're gonna guide you in the right direction there, um, give you the best advice possible. Things I missed, Randy? Um, just a couple things. <coughs> Excuse me, I uh, misinformed you. Uh, three quarter inches, which can chip them and it'll kill them. I, I don't know why I said a quarter, I wasn't focused. The other thing, there are native borers in America and they tend to bore vertically as opposed to horizontally. And the uh, emerald ash borer goes horizontally and that's what kills the ash trees. So if you're seeing tunnels under the bark and it, it, it isn't really affecting the tree, expect it to be a native ash borer. They're not terminal to the tree generally. 
over infestation, maybe it could, but uh, generally not. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to cut, touch base on. <sighs> Can't remember, but. Um, tags? Oh. Tree tags? Thank you. Make sure uh, if you have your tree treated, especially a boulevard tree, uh, make sure you tag the tree. Have whoever uh, injects the tree tag the tree so that we know when we're coming by, we see it somewhat infested, likely we're gonna take that tree. But if it's tagged, we'll leave the tree. So uh, those who are injecting trees within the city, keep that in mind, tag the tree, or we will put an X on it. And Matt, you know that. <laughs> I gotcha. How many injection points use on a, say, a 24 inch tree? Uh, Number of them or? Well, I do, that would be about 12 for me. 12 yep. injection points? Yep. Um, I kind of skipped over the positive side of all this thing is that um, a big part of our plan is putting new trees back in the ground. I mentioned that, you know, it's not going to be a one for one right in the location that we had, but um, we've applied for some grants from the state. And right now this year, there's just, there's pennies available to the entire state. Um, we're hoping to get our portion of that to help with this process. The plan would be a hope is that moving forward, there'll be more state and federal money available to us to maybe ramp up our process a little bit to kind of get ahead of this. Um, but part of what we are gonna be doing is like, as, as I said, replanting trees one-to-one. -one. That's part of our grant requirement. Um, but we wanna be a little bit more aggressive than that and plant more than one tree uh, when we take a tree. Again, it may not be exactly in the same spot uh, and it may not be a nice big boulevard tree. It might be a smaller tree. Um, that we plant somewhere else in the city, but I assure you that that is our plan, is that we're putting more trees in the ground than we're taking out. Uh, we cannot and will not tell residents what types of trees to put on their private property. We can tell you what to put in front of your house. If you wanna plant your own tree in your boulevard, um, we're gonna have you check with us first and make sure that the location is okay and that you're not putting up a maple um, or some other non-native species. Um, but. We're trying to work with local nurseries to discourage people from planting maples. Not that everybody doesn't love maples and they're not great trees, but we find ourselves in this situation where we don't want to be talking about maple disease or maple borer, you know, in 20 years because 60% of our population is now maples and we're doing all this over again. Um, so we're trying to diversify our canopy as much as we can. Last year we planted, we were part of a program and we planted 150 trees and out of those 150 trees, uh, I think we had 20 or 25 different species. Um, so we're really trying to spread it around where it really just looks nicer when we've got all different types of trees growing in the city, but we don't paint ourselves into that corner where, well, we just have, you know, 40% of our population is maple and here we go again. Okay, I don't know how many years ago it was, 10 years ago maybe I planted a linden. My mom said, that's a dirty tree. And I said, no. The sales guy said, it's great. It was, it was awful. There was something like every month, a new thing fell off it. Plus, it attracted aphids. So our whole patio was covered with aphid poof. And my hair would be full. I took it down. I couldn't take it. It was a healthy tree, but it was so dirty. So I'm going to tell you, steer clear of lindens. Unless there's... The Japanese beetles like those, too. Yeah, it was awful. And I've, yeah, and I've got so many of those beetles in my mind. So. And we've always been conditioned to feel good about planting a tree, and you should, and it is. But you gotta think this through. Like, it's like getting a puppy. Like, it's cute at first, but this thing's gonna be a dog and it's gonna be around for a while. Like, that tree is gonna grow in your yard and you're gonna be putting up with these aphids and beetles and whatever else that may come with this tree. So think through what it is that you're putting in the ground. And, Nothing against people trying to sell you trees, but remember, they're trying to sell you trees. Um, so do your homework, um, trust someone, do a little research, and then it's your property. Get something in the ground that you know you want to see stand there um, for some time that you can put up with. Um, trees, some trees look nice, and some of them are just annoying, and then you're like, I wanna get rid of this tree. Tree rebate. Oh, yes. Uh, good time to bring up, so, um Something that Jenna and I are working on is we're partnering with Austin Utilities. Um, they have a tree rebate program 
Um, right now, the list is a little outdated and we are working on updating it. Um, and we're working with nurseries as well to have um, um, species that you're not gonna see on this pie chart here. So things that um, are gonna be hopefully new and help diversify, but it's, it's just, you have to get, put a tree in your yard anyways, you might as well get a little money back. If you're interested in this program, we have some handouts. Could tell about, oh my God. <laughs> Another cool um, process that we're doing here within the city um, someone asked about the Nature Center, whether we had ash borer at the Nature Center. And of course we do. There's tons of ash trees out there. Um, the MDA treated that spe specific facility a little different than the city because it's a little different than the city. Um, so they came back later to confirm the presence of ash borer there. But the cool thing is, one, it's a nature preserve, so we do treat things a little. Some stuff is just going to happen out there. Um, but we're now part of a program with the MDA where we're going to release a bunch of wasps. I'm sure that all really makes you guys very excited. Um, um, but they're called parasitic wasps, and they're actually very gnat-like, and they're small, and their sole existence is to kill these ash borer. Um, so we're gonna be a part of that program this spring um, out there, and so eventually, over time, these bugs kill the other bugs, and then you might think, well, what's gonna come along and kill those wasps? Uh, we have to have coyotes out there to kill the wasps. No, <laughs> <laughs> the only thing these things eat are ash borers. So once the but once the emerald ash borer is gone, these these uh, wasps are gone too. So it kind of all takes care of itself. Um, so we're going to be trying that process. It's going to take a little time to kind of see results, but um, it's it's a really cool thing. Like it's an ecological way of of battling this. Um, that's not injecting chemicals into the tree, which no matter what to anyone still sounds like a bad idea. Um, although it's good. Um, so we are trying a few things. Because of the way things are laid out in the city, it's just not plausible. The MDA doesn't do that um, in a little bit more populated areas or where trees are spread out because the, the wasps themselves travel similarly to the way the beetles do. They just don't go that far. So it's got to be in a concentrated environment. But we are trying that. And uh, so our team is pretty excited about that as an option also. More questions? Yes. What was the diameter of the tree that you said you wouldn't treat? Let's say over 22. <laughs> over 22. Yep. Yeah, it's really not that big of a tree. So um, please be vigilant. Check your properties. Um, ask questions. Contact contractors. Invite them out. Um, many of them are here. I'm sure they're going to stick around for a few minutes and answer some questions for you. Uh, if you have them specifically of them. Again, the city, we are our, our forestry team, they are always happy to be a resource for you. You can always call and ask us questions. If we don't know the answer, we will find out for you and we will learn along the way with you and try to point you in the right direction. Um, but yes, Matt. Can I ask where that information came from on not treating one greater than 22 inches? Because I'm getting some kind of conflicting what I'm hearing is is the bigger trees, they, uh, uh, like municipalities up towards the cities, they look at canopy, not stem count. So the bigger trees have a little more value. So just, I mean, if I'm wrong, that's okay. But I just, I don't know where, because I'm getting conflicting. Not, excuse me, not necessarily wrong, but the uh, Department of Ag recommended that uh, anything 22 and less is uh, more responsive to treatment. Because uh, once they get larger than that, one, you got to die back anyhow, naturally, which stresses the tree. And accompanied by the, uh, in, uh, the, the insect, it also has problems. So they tend not to survive as well. That, that, that was what the uh, Department of Ag told me. But again, it's, I would say those numbers are somewhat arbitrary. And every circumstance is different. It may be a value if you have a 20. It's not like you give up on your 24 inch tree. If you think it's a value to you and you consult with your contractor and like, yeah, I think we could try this. It, it might work. Again, every homeowner has the option to do that. I mean, no one's going to fault you for trying. Um, it's your resources you're expending to try to do this. Just I would say the rule of thumb would be that the bigger the tree is, there are probably some more circumstances. It's like treating yourself. The older you get, you know, you never know. It might not be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Is, is the city on their own as far as 
the financial responsibility of this, or is there any outside funding resources that could help in this thing? Aside from a, a Department of Natural Resources grant that we've recently applied for, um, there aren't a lot of other resources. Um, there are no big pots of money. There are no big partners out there right now. Maybe over time that will change. Um, it needs to, um, just because, again, this thing is just going to keep moving to the west. We saw that little pocket in the northwest. You know, I would expect if we came back and watched the same slide in 10 years, that thing would be bigger and it would be moving back towards the east. And, I mean, it's, it's going to take resources to get all of this taken care of. Uh, we all just kind of have to do our part a little bit incrementally. More questions and concerns? Um, really do trust the Department of Natural Resources, um, the information that we have up there, the MDA. They have the most updated information. No kidding, these maps are live fairly, and you can go on there and see, you know, day by day, week by week, you know, updates to where these trees. The more we document this stuff, the better we can track it, the better we can understand it. Um, really, the more information that we have about all of this all the time, the better off we're all going to be. Um, don't feel that you're on an island, that you have to, you're doing this on your own. Um, to some degree, you are. It's your private property. But we want to be a resource, and we want to be able to you know, help get you through this whole thing um, as we go. So that's what the people in this room uh, are here to do. Did they find out a lot in their research on these traps? Down the road from where we lived, there was a, a thing they planted in the tree, and they said that was for a uh, trap for... Yeah. Really? Do you guys know anything about traps and what they're doing with any samples? That are this was like, well, three or four years ago. I think there were rumors that they were moving west, you know. It may have been their way of tracking it uh, without know. just waiting for the disease to... A lot of those are probably gypsy moth traps, aren't they? There are those triangle ones. Possibly. Them. What color was it? They had uh, like purple, like traps for EAB, but I think those would have been, um, those would probably be in areas where it's um, far away, where at least at least 10 miles of where it's already been confirmed. Um, so it's here now. So we wouldn't have them anymore because we already know it's here. Two years ago, what color was it? I, you know, it's been a while. It seemed to be gray. Yeah, white or gray. That was probably yeah. off white or gray. Yeah. That was probably a, a, a gypsy moth trap then. If it was a triangle, especially just like a like a folded kind of pyramid shape like this, like stapled to the tree, it could have been a gypsy moth trap. We have plenty of resources at the table, um, plenty of information, like I said, through the Department of Ag, through DNR, um, Parks and Rec. We'll do our best to keep current information. Um, available to you. We will keep doing these meetings probably at least once a month for ever um, to try to get people out. So if you have friends and residents and they don't trust your information conveying this to them, then um, please send us send them out to see us. Um, you'll all be streamed live, you know, all over the web after this. So no, just, <laughs> just our but, um, but yeah, the more we share this information, the better off we all are. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, feel free to stick around and ask questions if you want to, but we do really appreciate you coming. This is important. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you.